you did not? <laughs> well, he gave me 15 minutes, I guess. I'll try my best. The good thing is that when, you, when it comes to agroforestry and biomass production, well, we don't have a lot of experiments out there. There are a few studies here and there, but we don't have a lot of data. So, but I will share with you the little I know about biomass production in agroforestry or using agroforestry approach, mostly from a water quality point of view, how that can benefit uh, the landscape and the watershed. And you just heard Dick Schultz, so it's good that at least his talk was just before mine. So why bioenergy crop? You know all these facts and figures, don't need to bring it up, but still just to set the stage, energy security is as important for any country as food security. Well, we only worry about that when the gas price really goes up. If you look at the statistics here, in 2010, five out of 10 gallons we pumped in our cars came from a foreign country. Things have changed since 2010. Well, we hear a lot more about fracking. Well, we hear that in about 10 years, we could be producing a lot of oil in the US and we could be the largest producer. We could most likely take care of all our energy problems. Well, still, we have, at least right now, a policy, according to the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, we are supposed to be using 36 billion gallons of biofuels by 2022. That is about a fourth of the petroleum consumption in 2009. Well, if you read the fine print out of the 36 billion, you will also see that 21 billion must come from cellulosic biofuels. That means about 15 billion gallons from corn-based ethanol or biofuels like that, but then 21 billion some sort of advanced biofuels. Well, do you know how much biofuels were produced last year in 2012? Especially the advanced biofuels, cellulosic biofuels. We are close to the 15 billion gallon cellulosic ethanol. But how much was produced? Do you know what was the target? EPA target last year based on the ISA 2007? 500 million gallons. That was the target for 2012. Do you know how much we produced? Yeah, less than half a million. Wow, what happened? Well, two major bottlenecks. The first one, of course, we are talking about biofuels. The raw material is biomass, the sustainable supply of biomass. Well, there is that billion ton report out there. We have a lot of residue from farmlands, residue from forests. But then, what's happening? Why can't we get that residue into a biorefinery and convert that into ethanol? Well, there is a second problem here. Well, I haven't put the second problem here, but the second problem is the technology. Well, the technology is catching up now. There are a lot of promising technologies to convert that biomass into biofuels. But even then, we are talking about a low density feedstock. So the transportation becomes an issue. You cannot transport it very far. We used to hear 75 miles, now we hear 50 miles. Well, there is a plan going in Iowa, DuPont, they are talking about 30 miles. So that keeps shrinking. So you cannot, the bottom line is the biomass cannot be transported very far. So even if you have the low density feedstock scattered all over, even if it is a billion ton, it's of no use to your biorefinery unless it is available within that 30 mile radius. Then we are talking about not just getting the residue but also growing that biomass on a farm, much like corn or soybean, much like anything else. Having that sustainable supply, year in, year out, you can depend on that source from that particular farm to that biorefinery. So, can agroforestry help? Well, I mentioned earlier, agroforestry is flexible. You can introduce any design. 
any species combination if you can make it work. So let's look into what agroforestry is. Well, it looks like we just started the workshop assuming that you all know what agroforestry is all about. I don't think anyone actually gave a definition of agroforestry. Well, Dusty tried to give a definition of silver pasture. I didn't really give a definition of alley cropping. Well, in agroforestry, we say there are four I. I'm sure most of you have heard about those four I's. Intentional, integrated, intensive, and interactive. Nobody said agroforestry is low intensity land use practice. In the tropics, that is kind of the underlying assumption. But in the temperate zone, well, we manage agroforestry practices intensively. Well, if that is the way, then you can introduce some of these energy crops into any of our conventional agroforestry designs. So I will just give you a couple of examples here. Alley cropping. You saw this picture earlier. Black walnut and corn. Well, it could be black walnut or any tree species with any herbaceous species. And both of these components could be biomass crops. But one could be a timber species or a nut species. And the herbaceous species could be sorghum, switchgrass, a prairie mix, or it could be even willow. This is in Gulf, Canada, and they are experimenting with black walnut with short rotation willow planted in the middle. So it could be any of the bioenergy crop species in any of these combinations. So speaking of alley cropping, is anyone from the south here? I don't believe so. Well, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> well, some of you may have heard about the catch light energy. It's sort of um, an attempt to really commercialize biomass production in, in a new way. It's a joint venture between Chevron and Warehouser Corporation. So if you look at this, you can see this is a conventional model for southern pine plantations. Very intensively managed, very tight spacing. There is nothing underneath other than the pine straw. By the way, when the timber market crashed down south, that is what saved the landowners, the pine straw. Another way of thinking of agroforestry. Well, if you modify this plantation design somewhat, let's say you take down one of these rows. Because if you are growing this for timber, then it is long rotation, 25 years or more. Normally, they plant like this and they thin. So catch light energy, thought of it in a different way. Why can we start like that? wider spacing at least between the rows and plant something like a switchgrass mix in the middle. And that's what they are doing. So they are harvesting this biomass while the pines are growing. So a commercial example for alley cropping or intercropping to grow a biomass crop. Here is from Louisiana State University where they are experimenting with cottonwood and switchgrass as an alley cropping system. Well, we also have some trials we are just setting up with short rotation willows, short rotation cottonwood, well, hybrid poplar, and native grasses as an alley cropping for biomass production. And Jomi, I think you are also experimenting with similar ideas up in Minnesota. So we have trials now happening from Minnesota all the way down to Mississippi and Louisiana looking at an alley cropping model for growing biomass and multiple biomass. And there is, a, there, there is always an advantage in having trees and grasses. The trees you can, you can harvest pretty much any time of the year. Well, grasses, perhaps you harvest once in the middle of the summer, once to the end of the season, or maybe just one harvest. But if you think of a biorefinery, when they need a continuous supply of biomass, if you just depend on the grasses, 
Well, you have to store that biomass there. That adds to the cost. Well, if you can harvest the trees later, maybe in the middle of the winter, then it extends the life of your biomass feedstock availability from the field to the refinery without incurring the cost of storing the biomass on site. So there could be advantage in having the multiple feedstock. But there are some disadvantages. Most biorefineries would prefer one type of feedstock over the other. So it all depends on the market. Where can you sell that biomass? And what kind of biomass your local refinery is looking for? These are some numbers from one of the papers that I published with one of my former students recently, looking at biomass production potential of some of the, you know, the common biomass crop tree species and grasses. And you can see that annual yield here is like typical row crop, you know, let's say maize, corn. You also have sorghum here. But tree species like black locust, 7.3 megagrams per hectare, about half of that per tons per acre. So if you look at that, poplar can go all the way to 30 metric tons per hectare, 30. Well, if you look at some of the, the grasses, miscanthus, of course, a non-native grass can do the same thing, about 30 megagrams per hectare per year. Well, our native switchgrass can go up to 20 in some cases. But most often we don't reach that high of a growth potential. Most of them produce maybe about, like you see here, 10 to 13 or 15. But it gives you a range of these crops that you can introduce into agroforestry practices. And here is kind of a hypothetical model. If you have a mixed system, let's say this is the biomass, the solid line here, the solid black line, the annual crop, like the gra or perennial grasses, or it could be annual, like sorghum, planted in between the trees. You could grow the trees for 10 years, 12 years, 20 years, and when they reach their peak mean annual growth, you harvest them, or you thin them, and then you may replant them. But if you have short rotation willow or hybrid poplar that you harvest, perhaps on a two-year or a three-year rotation, then you can maximize the yield substantially for the whole system. And that's what you see in the red line here. And the design of the system could, again, be flexible. You can have a single row of trees and herbaceous species in the middle. You can have double rows of trees, like in the willow system. Or you can even have triple rows. Perhaps, you know, the middle row could be your timber trees on both sides could be the biomass trees, and then you can, you can have your herbaceous in the middle. So it's all flexible, depending on what you want, what the market asks for, and what's your landscape position. And speaking of landscape, let's say you are in the riparian zone. The design that Dick Schultz was talking about, you could convert that design into a biomass production system. This could be your native grasses or switchgrass or whatever you want to plant as a herbaceous crop. This could be the willow that could be harvested every couple or three years. And this could be your fast-growing poplars or cottonwood. That also could be harvested. You don't have to grow them for 10 years. But if that is indeed necessary to provide the large woody debris, well, you can do that. But in this zone here, you could grow them like fast rotation, you know, two to three year rotation cycle. So it's all flexible, it's possible. You can even use a riparian zone to make an income for biomass or, or by producing biomass. So, well, just wanted to throw in what Secretary Wilsack said about agroforestry's potential, especially the clean water. 44% of the rivers in the U.S., 64% of the lakes in this country, and 30% of the estuaries in the U.S. are impaired, according to EPA. And you heard from Dick Schultz for some of the reasons why we do have this problem. It's a major problem. And you heard from him again, the hypoxia issue in the Gulf of Mexico. 
and that is only one of the 405 hypoxic zones identified worldwide today. Look at this number here. We only had 162 such zones about 30 years ago. So, agricultural intensification is one of the main reasons. You look at just the Gulf of Mexico, well, Dick clearly explained why what's going on. He said nitrogen. Look at this number here, 80 percent of or 71 percent of the nitrogen. We look at all the land use practices and where that nitrogen is coming from. 71 percent is coming from our ag fields. 80 percent of the phosphorus causing this issue is coming from our landscape. Well, if you put, as Dick said, grass strips or trees or combination like an agroforestry, riparian buffer with grasses and trees, like a biomass production system, tremendous benefit in terms of 68% reduction in runoff, 45% reduction in sediments compared to like typical raw crop, corn soybean rotation. Surface runoff is reduced by 76%. Subsurface nitrate nitrogen, the leaching that I was talking about earlier, reduced by up to 93%. So, by creating these kind of systems, it's not only providing the biomass for the much needed well, biofuels target, but it's also providing all sorts of environmental benefits. Another example from Illinois, if you look at corn, the numbers are here, and that is the leaching of nitrate nitrogen. Look at all the biofuel crops down here. Very low nitrate leaching compared to corn. The same number if you look at nitrate and ammonium for multiple species. Again, I don't have the time to go through all these numbers. Here is just another modeling exercise. If you have a 100% corn soybean rotation and looking at the nitrate leaching and compare that with corn soybean with 50% of the landscape in Miscanthus, well, it's a 30% drop in nitrate nitrogen on a small farm scale. We converted one of our long-term trials about an hour and a half north of here where we had, you saw some of those uh, data earlier, when we have, where we had upland grass buffers and then upland grass buffers planted in trees like this and then a typical corn soybean rotation. So we converted them last year into a native polyculture mix. So it is just a grass watershed now, just almost like a prairie with multiple species. And this one has the prairie, but then in an alley cropping configuration, we have these trees. And then this is a typical corn soybean. Last year was a dry year. We didn't have a lot of rain. But still with the rain that we got, we had, by the way, it's a corn soybean rotation. Last year we had soybean planted here. And even with the dry or the drought we had, we had runoff in the soybean. But there was no water coming out of these two watersheds. So we can clean up the watersheds quite a bit if you have plantings like this of perennial species. Yes. So earlier, Dick Schultz mentioned, I think he mentioned too, that uh, some of these riparian buffers and perennials can't be much if it's seed banks well enough. It kept that. Do we have more perennials on the landscape overall? Or is that just a greater to less runoff because we're able to hold that water and actually reduce our future needs but not the needs? Exactly, yeah. So these are not riparian zones. These are, this particular trial is all about upland buffers. So that's exactly what he was talking about. We need more upland kind of buffers, whether, you know, they have a project called strips, either like strips, just grasses or grass plus trees. And we've seen in both instances, we have data now, you know, they, they work very well. But depending on the landowner objectives, it could be just grasses or it could be combined with trees like this. So here is another. And so we saw a, a small farm, a small watershed. Now here is a bigger watershed scale. Let's see what's happening. Again, this is also a modeling exercise using SWOT. The Radburn Lake watershed in Iowa. It's a 143,000 hectare area. If you look at the land use practice, 
80% agriculture or pasture, 9% forested, 5% wetland, 4% open bodies of water, 2% urban. So the exercise is all about converting part of that landscape into switchgrass. So there is a lot of discussion about switchgrass as a feedstock for biorefinery. Let's see what's happening when you convert 15% of the highly erodible and marginal land into switchgrass. So before I go there, I would like to draw a simple graph here and show what do you mean by marginal. So let's say this is So this is the quality of your quality of your land in terms of let's say the soil depth perhaps the top soil depth or it could be the wetness it could be like flooded dry ideal moisture any of those let's say this is your net economic return let's, let's say this is like zero below you get negative above you get positive okay so if it is low quality land to begin with, let's say very thin soil, and let's say we are growing corn, at some point, at some level of the soil depth, your operation is going to be profitable. Okay? Below that, let's say it's not profitable. So marginal again, because marginal means many things to many people. Let's say, you know, it is switchgrass. Let me use switchgrass as an example. The productivity may be low, but even based on some of the trials that we have at the South Farm, about half a mile from campus here, we've seen that even when the soil depth is very shallow, switchgrass produces a yield. And it is consistent even when the soil is very deep. They produce a decent amount of biomass. Okay, so as you can see here, perhaps it is better to grow switchgrass as a crop, maybe up until this point. But on soils of good quality, you are better off growing your corn or your rock crops. So we do have a lot of marginal land where it may make sense to grow a crop like switchgrass for the right reasons, because otherwise you won't make any economic return out of land like this. But that also then provides all sorts of conservation benefits. So in this case, they are converting 15% of the highly erodible and marginal land into switchgrass. Let's see what's happening. In terms of just the water yield, 10% runoff reduction, sediments, 55% reduction in sediment. Soluble phosphorus, 26%. Soluble nitrogen, 38% reduction. Sediment bound phosphorus and nitrogen, 36 and 39% respectively. And if you look at herbicide, atrocene, soluble 86% reduction and sediment bound 83% reduction. Huge positive impact just by converting 15% of that landscape particularly at strategic locations on that landscape, huge benefits in terms of water quality. So why? Well, Dick mentioned a few things about the rooting. I think Dusty, you also mentioned about the rooting depth and how that helps. If you look at agroforestry, much more roots present in the soil as a result of trees and grasses combined together. Well, grasses combined together, or grasses alone, also, as you can see, have a lot of roots in the soil. And these are grazed pastures. And you can see the comparison, rotationally grazed versus continuously grazed. You can see how much more roots are present in the, in the soil. That is the key. If you have an active plant, active root system, they keep taking up the nutrients and the water, filtering that water before it gets to either the groundwater or the surface water get before it gets to the creeks. 
or the leg. Well, it's the same thing showing that if you look at soybean or corn, where a cool season grass, switchgrass poplar, you can see the above ground biomass versus the below ground biomass. Look at that. If you look at corn, compare that with either cool season or switchgrass, warm season. See how much more carbon or how much more root system. This is the, you know, the, the carbon, but it also shows how much more biomass is down there in the soil, how active the root system is, how deep it can go. So a much better system overall for trapping all the nutrients. Well, this is my last slide, Mike, so I'm done. One of the projects that we've been working on for the last nearly three, four years, it's a consortium that we tried to put together. It's called Mr. ABC. It stands for the Mississippi Missouri River Advanced Biomass Biofuel Consortium with partners from Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Ten states bordering the Mississippi. And of course, we are there from Missouri. The idea is, can we plant biomass crops like the way we discussed? Not necessarily always in agroforestry configurations, but find the marginal land, like the land that I was talking about. It could be frequently flooded land. It could be where it is highly erodible. Rock cropping is perhaps not the best option. Find the land and establish these perennial crops. And agroforestry is all, all about introducing perennial crops into the landscape. So create a system. We do have about 100 million marginal acres like that. In this particular corridor, about 75 miles on both sides of the river. That's the only landscape that we looked at, 75 miles on both sides. And then we came up with about 100 million acres. Marginal acres convert just 10% of that marginal land base into a biomass biofuel production processing system. And we will solve a major bottleneck of the sustainable supply of biomass. That would produce up to 8 billion gallons of advanced biofuels. That means maybe a national model. We can, we can produce up to 30% of the national target just from this corridor. And that would be about 3 to 4.5 billion net economic impact in this particular corridor if we can make this happen. So there is a place, there is potential for growing biomass, including in agroforestry systems. And hopefully we will see the market, that is the key, the market evolving slowly for biomass, and hopefully by then our landowners will be ready to grow that biomass in agroforestry configurations like this. I hope I finished on time. There is. Of course, there are all sorts of logistical issues when it, when it comes to planting a short rotation woody crop, even, even long rotation. If you are growing trees like cottonwood for 10, 12, 15 years, well, you have to have professional harvesting equipment and, and, and in fact, folks to come in and harvest the trees for you. Let's say you are doing it on a two-year cycle. Well, there is machinery available that you can bring in and you can probably harvest on your own, but of course those pieces of equipment are expensive. So if you are just a small landowner, can you make it work on your own? Most likely not. But if there is a co-op of landowners involved in growing and helping one particular biorefinery, then that model may become very attractive. At that point, you may be able to afford equipment for the co-op to harvest all its members. There, there is a co-op here, they are called Show Me Energy Co-op in Centerview. Well, they are not growing any of the woodies. They are growing right now prairie grasses or prairie mixes, grasses and forbs mixed together. So they have been very successful, but then 
most of the machinery, if you are a farming operation, you will have the machinery for harvesting and bundling your, your hay. So, they are making round bales and transporting to a central processing facility where they are converting them into pellets. So, it depends on what is available, what can you do without perhaps getting into millions of dollars of investment if you are on your own, but if you are a co-op, it may be possible. It all, it all depends on the situation, of course, the market too. Up in Canada, they are experimenting with uh, what they call the, you know, the woody, what is it called, the balers that make the round bales using woody bio, bio baler, bio baler, that's right, the bio balers, because they have lots of what they call willow rings, you know, around lakes or small water bodies, they have willows growing naturally and they are trying to see if they can harvest and, and sell it for making pellets or, or, or woody biomass, mostly for biopower. By the way, on campus here, if you are new to Columbia, you would be interested in learning about this. There is a bio boiler. So, we have a power plant that can produce up to 100 megawatt of electricity. They have converted one of their boilers into 100 percent bio boiler. It uses about 100,000 uh, tons of woody chips per year to produce combined heat and power. Yes. Yes, show me is still up and going, yeah, but that is not the one. This is the campus, yeah, but the show me is still producing pellets, yeah. yeah. It is a, yeah, show me energy is, well, which one, show me or this, uh, oh, campus contracted that out to uh, an aggregator. Uh, so, they are providing all the chips. So, they are collecting from, well, they have lots of wood mills all around, but my understanding is that because of that, they can go a bit farther than the conventional, you know, 50 to 75 miles. So, they are going a bit beyond that, it looks like, uh, but they are providing all the wood chips at the moment. Yeah. No. No. They, they put a strict sustainable harvest standard in place, uh, so they are they have to follow that. It has to come from sustainably managed forestry operation. All right. Thank you all. Well, thank you both. Thank you.